Yeah, to replace one thing for another. Pretty simple. What is atonement? Does anybody, I assume you guys have at least seen that word before. Anybody have an idea of what it means? Yeah, paying back some sort of debt that you have or paying off um, some sort of debt you've accrued with God, for instance. What Paul suggests is that um, there's God's commands. And if you break them, you have to atone to correct for that. Uh, atonement doesn't have to have a technical sense. So if if, uh, if Anthony steals ten bucks from my wallet and I discover it, I can make him atone for it by saying, "Look, you have to give me the ten bucks back." If he gave it back to me, he would be atoned, right? It's just repayment. It doesn't have to be particularly technical. It's just repayment. Paul suggests that if you break God's commandments. It's like incurring a debt against God. It's almost like you loaned money from God and now you have to pay it back by atoning for your sins. However, he says, well... He says that no one can follow the law or God's commands perfectly. He says in Romans that you guys are all guilty. You guys all have a debt to God. And he suggests that the only way you can atone for it is death. So that, like, if you break your commandment, like, you know, you, you would kill somebody, well, then I guess, like, whatever, dying would kind of be an atonement that would be, like, equal, but, you know, I think it's kind of, like, the money thing, like, $10 to $10, you know, people, right, like, 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 what if, if you commit, like, adultery, how are you supposed to, like, undo that? Death. Just die all of them, or just by dying? Paul suggests it's all or nothing. Either you follow the law 100% down the line, or you have to pay the penalty of death. It's kind of like taking a class pass-fail, right? You guys are all going to get grades in the class. Nobody is taking the class pass-fail. You, you know, some of you are going to get A's, some of you are going to get B's, etc. Paul doesn't see the law as working like that. Paul sees the law as either you get 100% on every assignment, or you fail the course. Either you follow the law 100% perfectly, or the penalty is death, right? It's all or nothing. It's pass-fail. Perfection or death. The only atonement is death if you've broken the law. Now, one of his premises, right, is that all of you have broken the law. So what do you all owe God? Death. Right, you all owe God a death or your life. You owe God your life, so to speak. Now, the atonement that you have to give is your life. However, this is where the substitution comes in. You can substitute your, or sorry, you can substitute Jesus' life for your life. Because Jesus died, right? You can substitute his death for your death. You can substitute Jesus' death for your own. Now, just for the sake of example, let's pretend God is a loan shark. Let's pretend I'm God. You owe me five bucks, you owe me five bucks, you owe me five bucks, you owe me twenty bucks. 
Now, if I'm like Paul's God, you guys all owe me a debt, and guess what? I'm not going to just break your legs. I'm going to kill you because you haven't paid me back, right? Because the penalty is debt. You all have to pay with the debt. Whether you owe 5 bucks or whether you owe 20 bucks, or you owe me 2,000 bucks. You should not go play the horses. I'm telling you. You all owe me different amounts of money, but you all really owe me your life, okay? However, Kate over there, she really cares about you guys, so she could pay off your debt for you. She could give me 2,000 bucks, she could give me, what, you owe me 20 bucks, five bucks, five bucks, five bucks. Maybe you wanna pay off, right? You could substitute for them. You could pay off their debt. This is how Paul understands Jesus' debt. You all owe God your life, but Jesus substitutes his life for yours. That's why it's a substitutionary atonement. His life atones for your sins. Alright, now it's kind of weird, um, in part because if you owe me five bucks, and you owe me five bucks, and you owe me five bucks, and you want to pay them off, how much do you owe me? Three. You'd think it would be 15, right? If, how many people are in the room? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. 12, 14. All of you, all 14 of you owe, li owe God your life, according to Paul, which is how many lives? 14. How many times did Jesus die? One. So it's kind of magic. His one payment covers everybody's life. So that would be like if all these three owe me five bucks and you gave me five bucks that would cover all three of them at the same time. It's unclear how that works, but for Paul, Jesus' life substitutes for everybody's debt. Wait, does he think that because Jesus died that no one else is going to die? Like, as explained when people die. No, um, for Paul, the options are death or resurrection from the dead. Like, um, Paul's idea of the future, like when the apocalypse come and things are set right, God is going to raise the good people from the dead and the bad people he'll leave dead. And the people who are alive will presumably remain alive once the kingdom comes. So it seems like, the, like there's going to be a perfect kingdom established when Jesus returns and that will include the people who are alive now and the good people that he raises from the dead and everybody else he'll just leave dead. He doesn't really seem to have a developed concept of hell. He doesn't seem to think that Jesus or God will send you to hell. He'll just leave you dead. So the options again are death or resurrection of the dead. Now Paul seems to think the problem with the law is that people try to atone for their sins by following the law. And he says that doesn't work because you guys all owe your life. No matter if you break one, if you tell a white lie and it's a lie, boom, you owe your life. Right? It's all or nothing for him. Because of that, following the law won't do any good. So you can substitute Jesus's, or well, let me put it this way. 